how about we play a little game of myth or reality with IoT topics? Let me give you an example. IoT is dead. IoT is hard. There's no industrial AI without IoT. There's going to be 10 gazillion connected devices in 2050. Myth or reality? Rick Pelota agreed to come on the IoT show to give us his perspective. Rick has been in the IoT and industrial IoT domain for a long time. He created ThingWorks, among other things. So he's, I think, the right person to tell us if all of these are myth or realities. And that's on the next IoT show. Hey everyone, this is Olivier and you're watching the IoT Show. Thanks for tuning in. Today we have Rick. Rick, how are you, man? Hey, Olivier, how are you, man? Been a while. I'm great. I'm great. So Rick, um, you have a last name. You'll spell it for me. And <laughs> we'll, we'll go into the topic of the day, which is myth and reality uh, for IoT. And, and for people to realize why I personally think you are in, uh, you are the right person to tackle them is that you have some history in IoT. You know what you're talking about in many ways. But Rick, tell us about yourself. Who's Rick? What are you doing? What have you done as well? Sure. Uh, I guess you could, you could say my background actually started more in industrial IoT. Like, uh, so a lot in industrial automation, and we think about it, right? Sensors, uh, controllers, gateways, data, collecting lots of data. It was kind of a micro the intranet of things, right? That's kind of what a factory is. Um, over time, then I, I uh, started a couple companies in the space. I worked for big companies and small companies, the SAPs, PTTs, and Microsofts, as well as startups. And um, it became pretty obvious that uh, the challenge in this whole space was we've got all these sensors, controllers, and devices, and we need to be able to do something and build apps around. So a lot of my career has been in that space, um, helping people, you know, solve very specific problems around fleet management and, you know, uh, quality improvement, you name it. But it's interesting when we talk about IoT, right? Um, although my background is in IoT, I start a lot of my presentations with there's no such thing as the IoT. So we'll get into that. Oh. Okay. Anyway, nowadays, I'm mostly just doing advisory work in and around um, IoT, AI, robotics, things like that. I love that. I love that. And th there's that little thing in your past, which is called ThingWorks, right? Yeah. That some people know about that, right. you know, kind of like put together your perspective on what IoT is and, and, uh, and what is needed there, right? For sure. And I think it taught me that, um, and we're, I know we'll touch on this later today, we tried to build a platform that served two very different markets, the industrial IoT market, connected factories and utilities, and then the what we think of as the classic IoT, connected devices and you know equipment and things like that out in the field. And we, I, I quickly realized that they're very, very different things. So we can deep dive into that as well. Yeah, we will. That's one of the questions of today. So myth or reality? Let's start with that first one, which should be an easy one. IoT is dead. Well. What first question is, did it ever live in the first place, right? Is, is it a thing, right? Is there a market? Is it just a, a marketing term that we came up with? It's, I, I tell people it's, it is a rare meme do-over, if you think about it, right? Kevin Ashton, when he invented the term, you know, IoT 1.0, radically different than what we think of now. It was kind of artified, ubiquitous, you know, identity for devices. I think when it rebooted, it, it had a very different meaning. We had Cisco and IBM and, you know, everybody talking about smarter planet or connected this or whatever. Um, but, I, but I do feel like it's a capability. It's not like a market or a thing. It's a capability we have now to connect the physical world and the digital world. And to be fair, like I mentioned, we've been doing that in a probably a smaller scale. Well, not even necessarily smaller scale, a different set of technologies inside uh, manufacturing plants and power plants and things like that. Now we just have ubiquitous connectivity to the internet to do it a little bit differently. Okay, makes sense. And the way I like to present it as well is to say it's not a technology, it's a, it's a set of technologies that enable scenarios, right? So it's kind of like, like actually works with, with yours. So, so there is an IoT, right? Set of technologies. The second one is like myth or reality is, so IoT is hard. You know, 20 years ago, the answer was probably yes, right? And hard and expensive can be synonymous. Um, so if you, you kind of roll back time, we started to collect, uh, connect a lot of very expensive equipment, right? 
where the mm -hmm. cost of physical connectivity, the cost of putting intelligence in these in, in this equipment and machines and products, um, the engineering that it took to connect them and do apps was justified by the cost of the you know the, the product. Fast forward, I mean, it's the the barrier to entry. You look at microcontroller vendors now that have full stack IoT solutions, I you know development platforms, ready to go applications from from you know almost every sub segment you can think of, from health to transportation to whatever. Uh, it's never been easier. The problem remains, and just it ties in with the you know is IoT dead? Uh, it's it's really about enabling some kind of digital transformation, right? You're, you're trying to enable some new product, new service, new way of doing business. That's the hard part, right? If you, if you figure out, if you can verbalize what it is that you want to do, it's never been easier to, to implement technology to achieve that. Agreed. Um, yeah, use case. And, and, but that's true in any type of technology, right? You, sure. you don't do technology for the sake of technology. You do at the beginning when it's the shiny object, but then it dies down and or dies completely if it has no interest or doesn't allow you to achieve your goal, which is adding value, transforming a business, a product, relationship with your customers, customer experience, whatnot, right? And, and also, I, and I think it's, so there's the transformative stuff, right? And that's what we think of most often, uh, product as a service or, mm -hmm. you know, remote management and optimization, all kinds of, you know, managing buildings from afar. The flip side is, as we, you know, starting back with the early days, there still is some basic, you know, functional stuff around managing devices, updating them, doing OTA software updates, keeping them secure. Um, those kinds of things are kind of the foundation that you just have to have. Um, that's good hygiene, good cybersecurity hygiene, um, but okay. it, it's still just a foundation on which we got to, we need to do useful things. Yeah, yeah. And I found that these days that I found that the complexity has moved, has moved from do, when, when the, the concept of IoT was to do it yourself from, from scratch, you know, from the hardware, designing your PCB, putting an embedded OS in there, working the drivers, all the shebang, all the way up to the cloud. Fun stuff. <laughs> Nowadays, you have many vendors that provide bricks that you will, you will actually try and integrate together. And the bricks are, are more or less granular and, and provide more or less, you know, capabilities. And like you were mentioning, device management, securing a network, um, eventually data, uh, you know, uh, normalization, filtering, and so on. I personally think that the, the, the complexity has moved on to the integration part, like the lack of standards, the, 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 the um, heterogeneous nature of all these parts or services or offers out there, right? And unfortunately, the, you know, the, that problem isn't going to go away. Um, we've got innovation happening in parallel. There aren't a lot of standards in the space. There's legacy, right? Things, you know, mm -hmm. things live many, many years once they get out into the field. So at that application level, it really is essential that we deal with that heterogeneity. It just is what it is. I mean, truthfully, both of the um, startups that I was involved in identified that problem and said it's not going to go away. Let's focus mm -hmm. on helping people um, do that integration, build applications around that complexity, as opposed to the super simple you know, linear problems, which, quite frankly, it's okay to write code in those scenarios. As we get... If we want to democratize this stuff, it's going to take higher level platforms that let people assemble those Lego blocks, focus on the application work, and not on that kind of the low level integration, plumbing, you know, that kind of stuff, to your point. Yeah. So some level higher. Um in the stack, I would say. But um, so you, you alluded to that. Um, you know, you started in industrial domain, yeah. right? And the other question I have for you or, or, or statement I have for you to debunk is IoT and industrial IoT are one and the same. Yeah, they get they get conflated so often, right? By vendors, by by mm -hmm. uh, the, the press. Couldn't if you think about it, they couldn't be more radically different. One has a heavy edge bias. Industrial IoT, granted, there's a shift, you know, there's a, a trend towards moving more of that functionality into the cloud. But those workloads are probably 95% on the edge. It's not the problem of connecting to devices and sensors has largely been solved already. That's PLCs and SCADA systems and things like that. So we find ourselves connecting to systems that are often pre-existing and doing something useful with them. 
Often the users for that data are co-located with the data or inside that company. Again, that's changing, but you know that's kind of the bulk of those use cases. And there's almost no uh, duplication. That what you do in plant A, line one, line two is dramatically different, right? There are exceptions to that, but it tends to be very one-off. Flip it around to kind of the classic IoT use case. I've got a fleet of you know MRI machines or smart uh, uh, you know HVAC sensors out in the field. Those tend to be very homogeneous, right? That they're I've, I'm managing a million of these things or ten thousand of these things. Um, they're ninety-nine point nine nine percent. You're connecting back to the cloud or a data center over you know some type of uh, public backhaul. Um, whereas a lot of times the data stays within the, the facility and the industrial IoT use cases, and the value is different, right? The value in the industrial IoT use cases is around how many people and systems can extract value from that information. On the IoT side, it tends to be more correlated with the devices, that, how many devices are connected, how, how uh, sophisticated are those devices. So you get very different licensing, very different technical requirements, very different things you're connecting to. Um, and then, you know, obviously we'll need different vendors for both of those. Yeah. Is it fair to say that um, industrial IoT is certainly one of the oldest um, domains, or actually the industry, especially uh, manufacturing, is one of the oldest domain where technology arrived and is the most, is, is the most legacy, um, you know, situations. And is it fair to say that other domains are more prone to greenfield? solutions that actually can be addressed with more modern tooling protocols, whatever, and, and hence like, you know, go directly to the cloud or make it easier while industrial uh, domain is, is more about connecting legacy systems as we're saying. Uh, and, and so you have to cope with dozens of field buses and protocols and, and whatnot, which makes it, which makes it harder. And yes, you were saying also keeping the data there, keeping the data for many reasons down there um, on the facilities, on the premises. Yeah, that's a good, that's an interesting uh, point. And I think it's a pretty valid one that a lot of times those, because those sensors and controllers and other stuff existed, whereas if you go to retrofit, you're doing a smart city project, right? You want traffic optimization and, you know, street light optimization. Typically that's going to be new equipment that you're bringing in. And when we say industrial, like, Utilities certainly face that legacy problem, right? Lots of equipment out there. So that's an interesting line you drew there. And I think that's a that's a good one. I, I agree okay. with that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of following up on uh, you know that collecting of data, especially in the industrial world, um, it's about doing something with it. And the other statement I have for you to the bank or justify is there's no industrial AI without IoT. And I know you care about AI because on your LinkedIn profile, you know, your description is totally AI free, 100% AI free, right? Something like that. Meanwhile, yeah, oh, meanwhile yeah. two thirds of the companies I advise these days are, are doing something in industrial AI. So, um, oh, it's industrial AI, yeah, like that. I, I, and whether it's IoT or industrial IoT, that let's maybe back up and say, instead of IoT, it's connectivity, right? The ability to connect okay. to these things, extract the data, um, also to get the data in real time that we can use to execute the AI models that we want, right? Mm -hmm. To predict, to control, yeah. to, you know. To, um, and there's two, there's even a, a bifurcation in that, right? You've got, the, I call them the Eureka moment, AI kind of use cases. We're, we're going we're gonna to extract, you know, years of data, or extract or accumulate months or years of data train models on that and get some magic insight that, hey, if we run if, if we run them at 90% speed, they never fail. If we run them at 95% speed, they fail three times a month. So, but those are the kinds of things you can get offline insight. There are also things where the cloud is sort of a natural place to do that heavy lifting, right? You, you're going to need a lot of compute for some period of time to get those insights. When Then when you get more to kind of the operationalizing AI, vision systems, um, assessing a series of signals in the state of processes and equipment to maximize quality or uptime. Now, you, yes, you may leverage the cloud to train those models. Even that's starting to shift a little bit. But we need real-time, you know, accurate, clean, real-time data. You're seeing companies popping up now that are focusing on cleaning data for, for yep. AI. Um, and we need to kind of hybridize that. Right? We want to 
execute those models at the edge, even if we're training them and accumulating that data in the cloud. Um, so yeah, that's okay. kind of, more of a hybrid approach. Increasingly, yeah, so. I was saying, increasingly, you're starting to see, you know, think of like an aura ring or something like that. Right? Those AI models are running on peak or you know, Apple Watch. They're running at the edge. Uh, there's an incredible amount of AI and machine learning going on in these, these kind of devices. Yep. Yeah, totally, totally. So um, here's the next one. Um, and I, it, it kind of like extends. So you, you focused like just now on industrial IoT scenarios and and having this near real-time responsiveness of your systems implementing or, or executing ML at the edge. Um, so if you want to expand a little bit, you know, myth or reality, IoT is just about the data and pushing it to the cloud to deal with it. So that's something that lots of people are still considering. IT is about, you send all the data up to the cloud and the cloud will figure it out, right? So myth, reality? A little both, right? But it also depends on who you are. If you're selling cloud storage and cloud ingest, it's all about the cloud and all about <laughs> cloud data storage. <laughs> uh, but, you know, if you don't know what you're going to do with it, I'm not sure what the value is of just sort of sending, you know, the petabytes of data up to the cloud until you have some identified purpose for it. Um, and the chicken and egg problem there is, again, when you're trying these eureka moment things, maybe you do want to collect it to glean some insights, you know, but but that is what you want to, now you've said, that's my purpose. I wanted to, you know, find some ways to improve my product or my service. Um, similarly, you know, in industrial settings, less so than Traditional IoT, the cloud naturally, the data naturally resides in the cloud because that's where the devices connect. In industrial IoT, they've got historians and databases and stuff that already has that. So it's more of a lift and shift uh, challenge there. But still, the cloud's going to play a role uh, for for the model training. I think it's just more efficient. But the flip side is, you know, that IoT is just about leveraging the data. Not really. Uh, I mean, I, I, I use the examples I think we mentioned earlier. If you can't also up, keep your products up to date with the latest you know, application code, the latest OS patches, security, certs, it sounds like boring stuff, but it's super important. These are the things that kind of, uh, if you have a connected device, you have to have that kind of, of uh, operational hygiene. Um, and it's boring, but it's also not very difficult. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, IoT definitely goes beyond just pushing data to the cloud, sure. uh, especially as we all know, connectivity and storage, even in the cloud, are not free, you know? <laughs> I, I actually did an interesting post to this, and I, I, this should be an interesting discussion of its own sometime. Um, if you look at most of the cloud hyperscalers right now, ingesting the data is essentially free, and storing the data is almost free. Egress of the data is can be very expensive. So it sort of creates this one-way lock-in, right? So let's imagine mm -hmm. I want to, I store my data in cloud A where my IoT devices connect, and I want to do some advanced analytics in another cloud. That's that's not a very friendly scenario for, for the end user, the integrator, or the OEM right now. So it'd be interesting to, to determine kind of why that is and see if we can change that. Yeah, yeah, totally. The next one, um, every single, PowerPoint or presentation about IoT in the last decade starts or used to start with that many gazillion devices will be connected to the internet by 20 something. Right? Each time that data actually is pushed out and the number is growing or shrinking. But what is Rick's prediction on that one? Yeah, well, I mean, I think we all, uh, we, we all bought into that early on until you realize that the, the, what the number one kind of wireless protocol in IoT is probably what? Probably Wi-Fi, right? I mean, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth or, you know, something like that. But ultimately, a lot of these devices, the idea, the idea that every smart device or sensor needed to be backhauled to the uh, internet and ultimately to the cloud was a fallacy. You know, it doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. The cost to have every sensor have that kind of a radio and the, uh, the, the power needed uh, to operate like that. It just didn't make sense, right? Although that's what I think the early folks were talking about. So the gateway model with, you know, some type of backhaul, satellite, cellular, broadband, whatever, and then another kind of wired or wireless network out at the edge, that's that's kind of what we're having. So 
do you count all those devices that aren't actually connected to the internet? Yeah, then of course you, then those 60 billion numbers make sense. If it's, are they actually connected to the internet? It's a tiny fraction of that. Yeah. They have a relationship with the, with the internet, right? That's how, the way I would put that. They don't. They're not connected. They have a relationship. It's like you know, second level of relationship on LinkedIn, right? Well, and, and unfortunately, that hype um, kind of did lead to a lot of overinvestment, right? In some of these mm -hmm. uh, alternate wireless networks for IoT devices, and we've seen that the uptake has not been great. Those companies have been, you know, experiencing some real challenges. Um, so the hype was not not healthy for the industry as a whole either. Yeah. So following, following up on this one, and that's the last one for today, um, here is the statement. Um, connectivity in IT is about coming to agreement on a single or as little as possible communication protocol or transport, right? So one for home automation, only one for industrial automation. Um, it's a myth or reality. Man, we all wish it was reality, right? That that because it would certainly make everyone's life easier. But it's not the reality. The reality is that heterogeneity, or excuse me, heterogeneity that you talked about earlier. That's what we're faced with, right? Even look at the home automation world, right? I mean, alone as an example is mm -hmm. uh, Matter was going to be the you know, and precursors to Matter were going to solve all that in the industrial world. OPC and Spark Plug and MQTT were going to solve all that. Ask a systems integrator how much time they still spend dealing with point-to-point -point integrations, the complexity of that. Um, the problem is really twofold, right? It's standards take so long to become reality that they tend to be, the problem has changed by the time they're realized. Second part is anytime you get, you know, 50 people in a room, we all have our biases, our vested interests. Um, and the, the net result that comes out is not necessarily going to be what's best, but what gives everybody in there a win. And, uh, you know, I've been involved in standards efforts. I've seen this. It's their virtuous efforts. Don't get me wrong. But the, the net net results don't always meet what, what the end users really need. I hear you. Well, but Rick. Don't, don't hold your breath. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and then we'll continue inventing new ones. Um, yeah. You know, exactly. that are more efficient, that save the battery, or, or you know, that are more secure, or what, or are, are not centralized. I can see, like, so many reasons to invent a new transport or a new protocol that we should definitely expect more, right? And then certainly within vertical industries, too, right? The, you know, the electric power, the grid industry has those smart buildings have their own. You know, every, every sub-industry seems to have its own, and, and rightfully so. They kind of grew up out of needs that they had. Uh, but so the, the one to, you know, the one to, to beat them all has to be one that is generic and capable enough that you can layer on these industry specific. I mean, there's aspects of OPC that can help with that. The DTDL, which, you know, I'm a fan of, uh, you know, there's aspects of that that can help. But there, there definitely is no one to, to rule yeah. them all right now. Yeah. And if we find one, we'll call it our precious, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Awesome, Rick. Well, Rick, that's fantastic. Uh, we'll keep all the other topics for all the conversations that I'm sure we're going to have. Thanks for your time again. And uh, well, I'm sure I will see you soon again on the IT show, right? Sounds good. Great catching up. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thanks, everyone, for watching. See you.